Uh, in the series so far, we have uh, started out the, the series we've called Citizen, and we're discussing the nature of our citizenship, first of all, primarily, as being members of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and that that should be the defining feature by which we enter into any thought or conversation regarding anything political. Then we began to talk about priorities that all of us should have as kingdom citizens. So the next week we got together, then we talked about prioritizing speech, our ability to communicate effectively the gospel that the Great Commission mandates we be able to talk freely, or at least some level, about the kingdom of God. And even if we're not allowed to talk freely, we've got to talk, which means we're either going to jail or not. So prioritizing the freedom of speech is a big deal. Last week when we got together, we talked about prioritizing life and doing so by God's standards, not by human standards, not by the will of humankind. This week, we're going to be dealing again with the particular issue but I want to start by talking about dessert. Who doesn't like to talk about dessert? Who doesn't love dessert? Finishing a meal with something sweet, tossing all that sugary goodness into your mouth, it's one of the worst things we can do for our physical health. But perhaps we might argue the psychological ramifications of brownies and ice cream and cake are outweighing the cost to our physical bodies. Amen? Amen. In our household, you get dessert if you deserve dessert. You don't get dessert if you don't deserve dessert. Glucose for the godly, a big bowl of nothing for the naughty. <laughs> now, I found something interesting this past week. Sometimes I never, I never know where exactly my study is going to lead. But I was thinking of the idea of deserving dessert because I was thinking about the phrase just desserts. And what I discovered is deserving and dessert have a peculiar linguistic connection. They're the same word. They actually originate from the same Latin root, and then they've worked their way through the French language, desivere, which means worthy service or service worthy of an ending. So an ending of worthy service. That's the idea. The notion of dessert is that we get something when the service is done or complete. We might call it the worthy service finale. And the idea of deserve is not really that different, right? Deserve is that which our service, our good service, or our actions are worthy of. Deserve. Dessert. Have you ever heard the phrase, just dessert? Remember like watching He-Man as a kid and listening to He-Man talk about Skeletor getting his just desserts and thinking, that sounds good. He got to skip the meal entirely. He got to have just dessert. What a wonderful thing. That's not actually what the term means. The term just in this instance is a, an abbreviation of justice. And the term dessert as it is used there is actually a spelling and derivation, not of the term dessert as we have at the end of the meal, but of deserve. Just desserts is the justice you deserve. So when we talk about people getting their just desserts, that's what we're talking about. Now we're going to be in Romans chapter 13 today. Uh, that'll be kind of our primary text that we're going to be dealing with. And in Romans chapter 13, part of what Paul's going to do is he's going to describe the nature of just desserts. That ultimately, government exists to give people what they deserve. Namely, the justice they deserve. That's what government is all about. And the government that fails to give just desserts to its citizens is itself worthy of just desserts. Let's go to our master in prayer and then we'll begin. Our Lord and God, um, as we dig into the text again today, as we speak about the things that we're reading there and we think about the things that are reading there, Father, we ask that your spirit would be present and active, that you were, would enter into the inner man, that you would teach and train us and direct our thoughts and attitudes. May we be different because we're hearing from you. God, I pray that all my words are of you, and if they are not of you, Father, I pray they would be swiftly forgotten. We want to give you this time. We want to give you our mental efforts just now. It's in your most precious name we pray, by the blood of the Lamb that we pray these things. Amen. Now, hold your chapter in Romans chapter 13, and I want you to flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. So hold Romans 13, move back into the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're going to start today by asking the question, what is the role of government? Secondly, we're going to look at unjust justice. And thirdly, we're going to talk about righteous governance. 
What is the role of government? Politicians and promises. Politicians and promises. Those are two things that go together like nuts and gum. <laughs> Both things seem okay on their own, but they never quite work out together, at least not the way you think they're going to. What does a politician do after he dies? He lies still. <laughs> do you want another bad joke? Too bad you're getting one anyway. Why did the politician cross the road? Because he said he wouldn't. <laughs> In our culture, the political promises made on a campaign trail are pretty much openly regarded as an opportunity for the candidate to paint an elaborate tapestry of imaginary utopian fluff. Pretending they'll do things they know full well they cannot do, a politician failing to deliver on his campaign promises isn't even newsworthy. Nobody thinks anything of it. The fact that they just blatantly lie about what they're going to accomplish. I like Pedro Sanchez from one of my favorite movies, Napoleon Dynamite, who in running for class president steps up before the student body and says, vote for me and all your wildest dreams will come true. Now there's a campaign you can get behind. As absurd as those campaign promises tend to be, they actually tell us a great deal about what people think, what the voting populace thinks, that government is intended for. They tell us about what people think a government is meant to bring them. And so as we're getting going today, I want to ask this question again. What is the role of government? What is government for? Well, what does the average person think? Let's just trot out some ideas about what the normal person in our culture believes government is for. Many people think that government is savior. Government is savior. It's there to save us. The role of government is to usher in a utopia. Quick Greek lesson. Utopia comes from two Greek words jammed together. The words are ou tapas. Tapas is the word from which we get the word topic. It means place. A utopia is a no place. You will never find a utopia. They don't exist. So people believe the government is to usher in a utopia. What do they want? They want free stuff. They want protection. We want low cost. We want more free time. We want life to be filled with lots of good stuff and no bad stuff. That's what a government is for, right? People who believe this also tend to congratulate themselves on the moral good they do by voting for the candidates who make such promises, right? I'm a good person. Why? Because I voted for somebody who said they were going to do good things for, for people who are poorly off. Good people don't help people. Good people vote for a government that helps people. Have you noticed that mentality? Government is savior. Some people believe the government is a battleground, that the government is all about fighting for me. To listen to politicians, you'd think that every day they started out their day by putting in a mouth guard and boxing gloves and going out to throw punches. Have you ever heard a political ad that talked about fighting? I mean, pretty much every one of them does, right? Candidate X will fight for you. Fight for me? The implication is you're under attack, and candidate X will stand in front of you and defend you against everything that is coming against you. There are powerful forces bent on your destruction. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds about right. But why would that sound right? The reason is because we built in that hyperbole into everything we do in our government. It's always about fighting. It's always about a battleground. If you're thinking to yourself, well, what's the alternative? Uh, imagine this. Imagine reasonable people who carefully uh, refrain from hyperbolic language and behaviors. You know, like the rest of us have to do at work every day. Like we teach our children to do, right? Can you imagine a company that was built around fighting? where every employee showed up fighting with every, or a whole sector of other employees, and it was divided out that way. And yet this is the way we tend to run our country. Government is savior. Government is a battleground. How about this one? Government exists to do stuff. They create rules. They create bureaucracy. Have you ever seen the sitcom Parks and Rec? Parks and Rec, in their first season, developed a character that they expected to play the role of a certain villain. The character's name was Ron Swanson. He was a hyper-libertarian who hated government. And it was thought that the interplay between he and the protagonist, Leslie Nope, would be sort of a funny way to engage in interesting political debate. What the producers didn't anticipate with this was that this character and his approach toward actively doing nothing in a government system 
became so incredibly popular that they had to make him a sort of hero in the, uh, in the series. Many people would really like government to just stop. Just stop doing what you're doing. People like to talk about how our elected officials never get anything done. The implication is they're sent there to do stuff. And then we like to complain, perhaps reasonably, because when they show up, the stuff they do makes everything worse. I'm a firm believer in the statement, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The problem with officials who step into office with the intention of fighting or changing things or justifying their job by creating laws and bills and voting on them is that this practice tends to take things that are functioning perfectly normally and because somebody knows they've got to run another campaign, they begin changing things. And it usually works out for the worse. President Calvin Coolidge is perhaps one of the greatest presidents in the history of our country. Now, perhaps you've never heard that sentiment ex expressed. Calvin Coolidge, what did that guy do, you might be asking? And the answer is nothing. And it's what made him such a great president. Calvin Coolidge is a, a, a affectionately known as the great refrainer. He was a largely quiet man who was not a fan of government. Once he was approached by a Washington society lady, and she said, I bet my friends that um, I could get more than two words out of you. And he looked at her and he said, you lose. And then he walked away. <laughs> Coolidge's presidency was marked out by his commitment to let things go on as they were. The nation prospered greatly by his dogged commitment to keep everyone from creating new laws and by actively endorsing getting rid of all the bad laws. Sometimes the very best thing you can do is nothing. Let me just say this is a life practice. Sometimes the very best thing you can do is nothing. And nothing is often much better than what our politicians do. Now, what is government for? We've said that many people believe government is savior. Some people believe that government is a battleground where there's supposed to be this continual fight happening. Governments exist to do stuff, create laws, and make more and more and more bureaucracy. This is what many people in our culture think. But what does God think? As we said at the front of this series, if God exists, and he does, then it doesn't matter what human beings think. It doesn't matter what human beings believe. God is creator, God is king, God is the absolute authority, is the only entity fit to tell us what is objectively true about our circumstances. So what does God say that government is intended for? God is just. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32. Did you know Moses was a singer? Moses is nearing the very end of his life, and here's a guy who is, he's an old, old, old man. And he's led Israel for many years. And one of the last things he does is he composes a song for the Israelites to retain. And for them to sing and for them to know so that they could retain some of this information about who God is. Deuteronomy chapter 32 is where this song is laid out. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32 verse 1 through 4. Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Perfect justice is part of the nature of God. He is perfectly just. Now, what does justice mean? Justice means giving people what they deserve. What does justice mean? There's going to be a test later. What does justice mean? I want you to retain that for the rest of your life. Justice is giving to people what they deserve. Now, you might look around and think to yourself, well, if God is just, if God is perfectly just, then why isn't the Lord doing something about all of this? Because I look around at the world I, I'm in, and I don't see justice prevailing. The answer to that challenge is God is doing something about what's going on. He's vindicating sinners like you and me through the atoning blood of his son. And that which has not been covered by the blood of the Lamb of God will be brought into final judgment at the end of cosmic history. In the meantime, God has made an appointment. God has appointed human agencies to oversee and enact justice. Those agencies are what we know of as governments. What is government according to God? Let's look at Romans chapter 13. Government is holy. Government is holy. 
Now, what do we mean by holy? We mean set apart for a particular purpose. What is the purpose that government is set apart for? Justice. Oh, good job. What's the purpose that government is set apart for? Justice, which means what? Giving people what they deserve. Okay, I told you there was going to be a test. We're going to come back to it. Romans 13, 1 and 2. This is Paul, and he's speaking to the church in Rome. Romans 13, verse 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, granted by his permission and sanction. And those which exist have been put in place by God. Therefore, whoever resists governmental authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who have resisted it will... Uh, it, or those who have resisted it will bring judgment that is civil penalty upon themselves. So let's first begin by remembering who's talking and who he's talking to. This is the Apostle Paul. He is a Roman citizen, and he's writing to the church in Rome. Rome is the empire that controls the world at this time. So writing to Rome, Paul has a couple options here. Paul could write to Rome and say, listen, most of our human governments really stink. How will that be received by the Roman Empire? Not very well. And yet Paul still manage, manages to say that in this text. Let me show you what we mean. Paul is writing them, and, and Paul is addressing a very real scenario here. The, the scenario is this. Christians rightly understood that Jesus Christ is our king. He's the ultimate arbiter of truth. His law is the one to which we are all beholden, and it, our, our primary devotion belongs to Jesus Christ. That's true, isn't it? If you're a Christian citizen, amen and amen. Now, with that acknowledgement, many Christians took a next step. We might say an overstep with this truth. Christians began to hold that all forms of government were entirely worthless and that a follower of Jesus Christ was not uh, only beyond the authority of a government, that governments created by men were inherently derelict. Paul is writing toward this mentality, and he's saying that's not true. Paul challenges the notion. This is theologically incorrect. He says government was part of God's design and that God ultimately through his active will or his passive will grants the authority to a government, which means that sometimes we get governments that we don't want because we desired it, we chose it, or because we deserve it. Amen? That can be a curse of epic proportions. But government, the idea of government, was God's idea. Now, Paul's going to go on to describe what God believes a government is for. Let's continue looking at the text. Remember, what is justice? Giving people what they deserve. What Paul's going to do next is he's going to communicate to the center of the Roman Empire what a government ought to be doing. Romans chapter 13, verse 3. For civil authorities are not a source of fear for people of good behavior but for those who do evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will receive approval and commendation. So what ought a government to do, according to Paul, as he's writing this to the church in Rome? It should cause the wicked to fear greatly. And it should allow the righteous to flourish, and not only allow, allow the righteous to flourish, but should grant them approval and commendation. Good people should be allowed to go on as if the government weren't there. Romans chapter 13, verse 4. For he, the government, is God's servant to you for good. But if you do wrong, you should be afraid, for he does not carry the executioner's sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an avenger who brings punishment on the wrongdoer. This speaks directly to the issue we brought up last night. A government is intended to punish harshly wickedness, particularly vile wickedness the government should be implementing a death penalty for. It's described over and over again in Scripture. Okay, so what's Paul saying here? Paul's saying the optimal government, the government that's functioning according to God's standards, makes it its business to give people what they deserve, either commendation or condemnation. You with me? How is our government doing at carrying out this task? Our world's governments are beginning to lean away from an idea of justice by God's standards to an idea of justice that is completely outside of God's standards. Let's talk about unjust justice. You go to Wikipedia and you type in a statement, social justice, or a topic, social justice. Here's what you get. 
Social justice is also a concept that some people use to describe the movement toward a socially just world. In this context, social justice is based on the concepts of human rights and equality and involves a greater degree of economic egalitarianism through progressive taxation, income redistribution, or even property redistribution. These policies aim to achieve what developmental economists refer to as more equality of opportunity than we may currently or may currently exist in some societies and to manufacture equality of outcome hang on to that phrase equality of outcome in cases where incidental inequalities appear in a procedurally just system equality of outcomes balancing outcomes let's talk about that idea for a moment the phrase of quality or equality of outcomes is a principle anathema to hard work Equality of outcome and hard work do not go hand in hand. It means we want to see everyone, regardless of what they do, end up in roughly the same place. Now, that might sound good to you. Does it sound good to God? Is it what God had in mind? Let's first ask ask the question, how was wealth created? How was wealth created? If you are a social justice warrior, you believe that wealth is all created through exploitation. The world assumes that this is the case. If someone has money, if someone has the means of production, that person got it through victimization. Is that sometimes true? Yeah. Is it always true? No. Are there individuals who worked very hard and risked very much to earn what they have? Let's see what the scriptures say along these lines. Proverbs talks about it a lot. Bear with me as I just run through a quick litany of scriptures. Proverbs 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless things lacks common sense and good judgment. Proverbs 13.4, the soul, that is the appetite of the lazy person, craves and gets nothing, for lethargy overcomes ambition. But the soul, that is the appetite of the diligent, who works willingly, is rich and abundantly supplied. Proverbs 13.22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the hands of the righteous. Proverbs 21.20, there is precious treasure and oil in the house of the wise who prepare for the future, but a short-sighted and foolish man swallows it up and wastes it. Proverbs 20, verse 4, the lazy man does not plow when the winter planting season arrives, so he begs at the next harvest and has nothing to reap. 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone fails to provide for his own, and especially for those of his family, he is denied the faith by disregarding its precepts and is worse than an unbeliever. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, the thief who has become a believer, must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living, producing that which is good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. Is there wealth that is earned through wickedness? Yes, absolutely. Sure there is. Is all wealth, all property, all security, all beauty, all enjoyment earned through wickedness? Of course not. Now let me ask you, what does the Bible say about hard work? We just saw. Is hard work good? Should hard work be rewarded? Yes, it's described as part of the very nature, or the very fabric of how God created this world. Proverbs 14, verse 23 says it this way, In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Paul told the church, Work hard as if working for the Lord, recognizing that the labor you produce for your king, Jesus, reflects on him and his character. Paul advised Timothy regarding lazy people in the church that if any able-bodied person is not willing to work, that we should not feed such a person. As a church, do not take care of such a person. Justice is when people are rewarded according to their efforts. Now, you might be thinking, what's so bad about a culture that doesn't honor and promote work by rewarding it, by rewarding the fruit of labor? Let me just try to express this with a metaphor, with a quick analogy. I want you to imagine that you're in a college course and you've studied very hard for your first exam. But after the first exam, you get your paper back, you got a 94%, feeling pretty good about yourself, right? The professor informs the class that he's very disappointed. While the median grade is right where he expected it to be, he notices that some people really excelled while others did very poorly. So the professor, being an enlightened academic of the social sciences, knows that it's not the fault of those students who did poorly. 
There were probably inequalities in the test that favored certain students over others. And what he needs is to see more equity. And so the professor says, we're going to handle class as socialists now. As a socialist, I will henceforth be dealing with everyone's grades accordingly. With each test, says the professor, I will take points earned by the highest achievers in class and redistribute them to those who earn the lowest grades. Question, will you work as hard on your next test? Okay. So some people maybe study a little bit for the second exam. They throw a little bit of effort into it. The second exam arrives. Points are redistributed as the professor planned, but unsurprisingly, the median grade has gone down. So much so that half of the class is now failing. Ah, declares the professor. People are so upset by inequity that they're not studying. I know how to fix this. We're no longer going to deal with your grades. We're no longer going to deal with your grades as socialists, but as communists. Everyone will get the median grade from now on. This will ensure that everyone thinking with community values and desiring to uplift their fellow students will now work as hard as possible to ensure that the whole class benefits. Question for you, will you study for the next exam? No, absolutely not. And so the third exam yields results that are so bad that now everyone is failing, but it's okay because now we have an equality of outcome. It has been achieved. If you've ever looked around at the history of the world, if you looked around at countries right now that have communist ideologies, and you've noticed that people are barely making it by, and ask yourself, why is that the case? I mean, after all, they have access to all these resources. That's your answer right there. If you cannot enjoy the fruit of your labor, if you're working hard, but you're not seeing any result from your hard work, there's not much incentive to work hard. Is there a result from you working hard for the kingdom of God here and now? The scriptures are very clear that there is a level of reward based on what we're doing right now. Who, by the way, is very happy about level reward for the kingdom of God? It's people who are working hard for the kingdom of God. Who's not in favor of level of reward for the kingdom of God? It's the people whose goal is to scrape by by the skin of their teeth, isn't it? God's perspective on labor is that it is good and it is worthy of reward. Equality of outcome is not a godly nor a Christian principle. It is by its very nature unjust. A perversion of justice. When we talk about social justice, we're not just talking about redistribution of wealth. We're also talking about changing how justice is instituted. How about fixing our world's injustices by tipping the scales just a little bit? I want to say this as we get going. Where there are legitimate injustices, every one of us, should step up and say, that's not right. What you're doing here is entirely wrong. But if we're creating phantoms of injustice in order that we can fight phantoms and constantly turn people against one another, then we've got problems. If a certain ethnicity is being denied employment or college admission because of their ethnicity, that is wrong. If men are arrested and sent to prison simply for being male, that would be an injustice. If people of the lowest income bracket are allowed to run over a person with a car twice a year without criminal repercussions, that would be genuine injustice. That might sound fun to some of you. Social, so, social justice, as our current culture describes it, is usually an attempt to vilify sectors of our population who are not really doing anything wrong and to give pre- preferential treatment to others regardless of whether or not they've earned it because of their status as victim. It should be noted that the status of victim need not be earned by actually being victimized. It often has much more to do with simply the identity of victimhood. A person identifies as a group that they call a victim, and now they believe that they're entitled to not be held responsible for their actions or what they do. Which does Christianity emphasize more? Your ethnicity or your deeds? Your deeds. It's about what you do. It's about the things you put into practice. Should we care about victims? Yes, when people are legitimately being victimized. Uh, The scriptures indicate as much. Deuteronomy 24, verse 17, you shall not pervert justice due to an alien, an orphan, nor take a widow's garment and pledge. Deuteronomy 27, 19, cursed is he who distorts the justice due an alien, an orphan, and a widow. And the people shall say, amen. And all you people would say, amen. But how might something be perverted or distorted? Well, we know by treating them over harshly, 
the alien, the foreigner, the widow. These were people who did not have representation in the culture, no one to take care of them. And so many times the perversion of justice was them being unfairly targeted. But is that the only way to pervert or distort? Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20. Here's what uh, Moses renders as the law for the people. You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all of your towns, which the Lord your God has given you, according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be, listen, partial. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of justice or of righteousness. Justice and only justice shall you pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God has given you. Listen to the way it's stated again in the law of Leviticus, in Leviticus 19. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. In other words, you don't elevate victims just because they have a particular status. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great. You are to judge your neighbor fairly. In other words, do not take into account their circumstance. Just render what is just. Kingdom citizens should believe in complete equality before the law. In other words, I want everyone treated fairly and equally by our government. The rule should apply to princes, and it should apply to paupers. Is that the way it's worked out in our culture? In all culture, what we see is sometimes people are given a pass because of an ethnicity or because of social standing or status. Other people are given a pass because of their political connectedness or because of their wealth and prosperity. We have all seen people tremendously guilty of things that you and I, if we were to do them, we would have to go to prison for or even be sentenced to death for, and these people get a slap on the wrist, or they get media coverage that diminishes the problem and sends them on their way. That is injustice. That is not the way a culture ought to behave. That is no way for a government to behave. You have to ask yourself as you're looking at these laws and the lack of implementation of the law in certain cases, whether or not people in power actually want equity whether or not they're looking to divide people and inflame hatred between tribes that they are creating. More on that story next week. What role does envy play in propagating views of inequity? Is envy okay? No, it is not right. It's not righteous. Can you rejoice for what others have, Christian citizen? Amen and amen. Or should you be angry at people for having things? Can you be content with what you have or do you foster jealousy? Can you work hard to earn more or should you blame everyone else for what you don't have? Do you want wealth no matter how much it corrupts you? Or do you trust that the God of this universe would not put you into a position where you would be corrupted and ruin yourself spiritually by the material things you have? See, if your citizenship is in the kingdom of God, you recognize that more is going on than just acquisition and getting more for me and more stuff that I need. Envy is ugly. Discontent does not become us. Pretending like you're wanting for someone else, by the way, is not fooling God. Problems begin to exacerbate when the government thinks that it's the church. Before this next portion of the message, I want you to imagine this scenario. I want you to imagine a culture that has poverty and it has need. But within this culture, there are subcultures, there are places, pockets of a peculiar people who gather together to learn, to love one another. They worship God and they hold one another accountable for doing right. In these subcultures, wherever they meet, they take care of their own. These gatherings teach that your biggest problem is not financial poverty, but spiritual poverty. They want to help you take care of both things, but to be part of these little pocket organizations requires that you abide by rules and that you allow them to help direct your path away from harming yourself or harming others. Imagine in such a world how many people in the desperate situation of poverty would be driven directly into these gatherings that you and I know of as the church. Now, if you were an adversary, an intelligent adversary, you were staring down this predicament of all these people who would be driven into those little pocket groups. What would you do to keep the church from fixing broken people like that? My guess is you'd try to create another institution that took the role of the church in most people's lives so that people did not turn to the church for help, but people turned to the government. 
Will we ever fix poverty this side of eternity? Matthew chapter 26, 7 through 10. A woman came to him with an alabaster vial. This is Jesus. He's eating at a dinner party. A woman came to him with an alabaster vial of costly perfume, and she poured it over his head. He reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this, and they said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price than the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother this woman? For she has done a good deed to me, for you will always have the poor with you. That's God talking. You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, this passage is really important because it tells us two things about the kingdom of God. Number one, it says that that Jesus and his disciples concerned themselves with the poor. This is why the disciples were like, we could have sold this and given money to the poor. So they were concerned with the poor. But this also tells us there are things more important than simply feeding people. But don't worry, the government will fix it. It's been quipped that one of the most terrifying phrases that could ever be uttered is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. (laughs) What's the problem with letting a government fix poverty? Well, the problem is how they choose to solve things. They choose groups to implement the help. One of the groups that they've chosen to help implement that help is Planned Parenthood. It's one of the biggest recipients of our efforts to help the poor. You don't like that? Tough luck. Washington decided that's how you were going to give, and that's where your money was going to be given. That's how it's going to happen. How do we fix poverty? Let's kill babies. And overwhelmingly, let's kill black babies, by the way. That's Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is one of the most racist organizations in the history of the world. If you don't believe me, I would challenge you. Please look up the legacy of their founder, Margaret Sanger, and eugenics. In a letter to Clarence Gamble, uh, Dr. Clarence Gamble, she explicitly stated, and I quote, these are her words, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Consider how Planned Parenthoods are located primarily and overwhelmingly black population centers. Margaret Sanger, by the way, spoke again and again. She had speaking engagements all the time at Ku Klux Klan meetings. There's your Planned Parenthood. Another problem is that many government solutions reward bad behavior. Welfare seems like a great idea on paper, but does it actually help get people out of poverty? It's broadly acknowledged that the well-intentioned social program creates a culture of generational poverty where people don't work except at gaming the system. And it's not really the government's fault so much in that regard because governments really can't take care of issues like this. The church was made to take care of issues like this. Governments tend to throw money at problems. It's realistically about the only solution they're capable of most of the time. But what's the result of throwing money at dysfunctional lives? Does it tend to solve the underlying problem? What about the church? Is the church supposed to deal with poverty? Is working with the world's poor the church's responsibility? Let me be very political by saying yes and no. Yes and no. What do I mean by that? Let's start by talking about caring for the body. Now, you might find what I'm about to say next just to be a bit callous, but I would ask you to begin thinking about this as a citizen of the kingdom of God and hear what I'm about to say in that context. The church has to care for the physical needs of those inside it. Caring for the needs of those outside of the church is optional. I'll say it again. The church has to care for the physical needs of those inside it. Caring for the needs of those outside of the church is optional. Remember, you are first and foremost a kingdom citizen, and I want, you, I want to ask you a question. If, the, if financial poverty is the worst thing that can happen to a person, is it? No. If we could give everyone on this planet food, shelter, and comfort, have we succeeded in fulfilling the Great Commission? No, we have not. Another question. Would you personally prefer to have all your material needs met and be headed toward hell? or to struggle with physical needs, be driven into the church and be saved? The latter, right? God's intention for the church was that we could care for one another, not merely giving a handout, but helping people address the root problems of poverty. So that those outside of the church look at us, they see us resolving difficulties in human lives, and say, I need to be part of a a group like that. Listen carefully to the following verses. 1 John 3, verse 17. And we're talking to the church here. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother, his brother 
in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? In other words, we, church, are responsible for caring for the church. If you've got money, wealth, prosperity, then you, not through the government, but you have the responsibility to give and take care of other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Who? The church. Fellow believers. To the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Who were the impoverished that the church cared for in the book of Acts? It was the church. Who did they take up collections for? It was the church. When they gave money, who were they giving it to? The church, Christians, taking care of other believers elsewhere in the world. Now let me clarify one area where I think we are obligated to give, and that is to perspective church. In other words, in particular, uh, when James describes good and godly religion, remember what he says, undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. I believe that Christians have a particular call to deal with orphans and children. It's a major part of what we should do. Because they're becoming church. They are those being saved. Government thinks it's God sometimes. And that's a step beyond and a step worse than thinking it's the church. It is a particularly wicked, may I say a devilish, devious government that sets fires and then claims it's the only one that can put them out. Again, more on that next week. I would argue we are currently facing down a governmental system that either doesn't know its place through ignorance or more likely a governmental system in which people in power desire more and greater power wanting not just what belongs to Caesar but what belongs to God. Let's talk about righteous governance. Can we end on a good note? Amen and amen. There's nothing like being really, really hungry to make you appreciate a meal. If you've ever tried fasting, and I hope you have, it's an important spiritual discipline, you know that as you're going through that fast, suddenly you think about the concept of peanut butter, and you're like, oh, peanut butter's good, <laughs> right? And, and everything that you can think of, every food, the stuff we take for granted on a regular basis, you think about it, and it's just like, oh, that would be so great to have that right now. There is nothing like broken governments to crave, that make you crave good government. Let me say it like this. The best governments we have in the world right now are cream of wheat with nothing in it. Where they're a bad meal. They're a meal where you have to throw out a portion of whatever's on the plates because it's spoiled, it's rotten, it's no good. And to some degree or another, we're all clamoring for and craving something else. What are we craving? A perfect king with the government upon his shoulders. He will reign perfectly. It is what we are hungering for. It is that need that we are wanting to be met in a governmental system. Remember what I said a government is for. It is for implementing what? Justice. And what is justice? Giving people what they deserve. I want you to think about what Christ is going to instigate. A perfect government punishes the wicked. A perfect government punishes the wicked. Yet in this world, so much of wickedness doesn't just go unpunished, but gets rewarded and even enshrined. Are you hungry for judgment? Perfect government commends the good, yet this, this world, in this world, virtue does not only go unrecognized, but often it's even targeted by political powers and forces. Are you hungry for judgment? Good news for you and I today. God's perfect justice is on the way. In the meantime... What's our role as a church? We are to care for the poor in the way we were commanded. Actively, church, actively care for the needs of fellow believers, not just in this building, but fellow believers around the world. It's important for us to support missions work. It's important for us to take care of believers who you might know at work, other people who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an obligation to it. 
not just a handout. And I would say this, only support organizations that are not just handing out, but handing out the gospel. If they're not doing that, they are not deserving of your money. That's money basically being thrown away. Care for those impoverished and those in need must involve more than filling a belly or providing shelter. It must involve the hard work of fixing people's lives by teaching them to obey all that Christ commanded. If we simply fill up somebody's bank account, we have done nothing for them in spiritual terms. Secondly, the church must keep its head clear in matters of justice. Proverbs 28, verse 5 says this, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all things. Is our politicians and media get increasingly bold about openly lying and manipulating the population with injustice? You, Christ follower, must be shrewd and discerning, and you should only vote for people who are shrewd and discerning. The only way to be so is to be in tune with God through Jesus Christ, to call out a culture that calls good, evil, and evil good. And when you see it, you should say it. Thirdly, we should pray for justice daily. Are you like me? Do you get a little bit depressed sometimes when you see raging injustice in the world? Does it upset you? Does it like tend to cause you turmoil where you just can't forget it and you mull it over? We've been given a prescription for that. Luke chapter 18, verse 7 and 8. Jesus tells this parable. He says, there's a widow, and uh, she goes to a judge for justice, and he's an unjust judge. He's not good. And she asks for justice, and he, he won't give it to her. And so she goes back to him again and just keeps going back to him over and over again. Give me justice. And he says, because of the petitioning, eventually this unjust judge is like, okay, fine. We'll deal with it this way. Luke chapter 18, verse 7, 8, Jesus says, Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? And will he delay over long for them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When you look around the world and you're like, this stinks, your first instinct, believer, should be to go to the Lord and go, this stinks. Would you bring about justice? Lord, I'm crying out to you right now. Our culture needs you. The church needs you. Come swiftly. Two things will happen. Firstly, our prayers will be answered with a yes. Either they will be answered with a yes now, or they will be answered with a yes when Christ returns. Secondly, it changes the way we think about things. It reminds us what is on the horizon. A perfect judge is coming and he will bring perfect justice. The court date is set. Paul says much to the Areopagus as he's speaking to these non-believers. He says, uh, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. And as we're closing out today, can I just read you about that soon and coming day? Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Justice is coming. God is the author of justice. And if you want to know justice, you have to know him. Let's go to our master in prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, we live in a world that is very confused on a lot of issues. And Father, sometimes the noise is so great that we even get confused or perplexed in the midst of it. I pray that we would be a people of clarity because we see you and know you. Father, help us to see and discern justice as you discern it. We love you, O oh God. In your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.